see. Yes, algorithms in hiding. So I'm going to share three ways that algorithms hide in plain sight. The first uh, is to stop the creepiness, but not the creeping. The second is targeting specific groups of people. And the third is the mathematical magic show. <laughs> in my series called Who Created Our Artificial Unconsciousness, I spoke about how people like Target Dad found the recommendations of AI creepy, and this resulted in the need for AI recommendations to be hidden among other ads so it didn't raise suspicion. So this first method is called stop the creepiness but not the creeping. This is how the algorithms hide. Keep in mind, history repeats itself. Even before Target Dad, there was already a history of hiding data and algorithms that automatically makes decisions that has a profound impact on our lives. And this is what Kathy O'Neill refers to as weapons of math destruction in her book. So in, in her book, Weapons of Math Destruction, um, which you can find on Amazon, you can you can click the link. Uh, Kathy, who is Kathy? Kathy was a data scientist for some of the largest hedge funds during the subprime mortgage crisis. And so she saw firsthand the impact of these mathematical models on people. And she felt compelled to write a book to help us understand what is really going on. And I am so thankful that she did because I have learned so many insights from this book. It has been incredible. So if you haven't picked up this book one, this book, uh, I highly recommend it. It's also available on Audible as well. I've enjoyed listening to the, the audio book as well. Um, so very, very interesting. Um, so many workers are subject to weapons of math destruction or WMDs without even knowing it. Even if a worker doesn't use social media or they don't use a freelancing AI like Fiverr or Upwork, they may have still taken an IQ test or a big five personality test. Now, IQ tests were often used by employers to determine whether or not people would be suitable for work. And it was only during the arrival of the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA that this became this practice became of using IQ for employment became illegal. So uh, this should be of no surprise to anybody who's a longtime listener like Alice. Um, as we've seen with cookie tracking today, when the public becomes aware of weapons of math destruction or WMDs, what typically happens is that lawyers or lawmakers, they argue to change the rules and regulations. But this does not mean that they stop using WMDs. Instead, they are often replaced with inferior pseudo-anonymous systems that are even more harmful. Now, I previously talked about cookies being replaced by session IDs and then ultimately the federated learning of cohorts where it just records this anonymous AI model of your unconscious desires. Um, and the key is you have very little knowledge of what's recorded and even less ability to argue against the decisions that are made. Um, so what happens over time is that things get worse rather than better. And so that that is key. And ultimately, the other example, let's go back to the example of IQ tests. So IQ tests were replaced with job applicant screening systems like Kronos. These systems required the potential candidates to do a big five personality test before they were considered for hiring. Uh, the big five personal personality test looks for extroversion, neuroticism, openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Those are the big five. Now, the problem with these personality tests is that they heavily bias against the people who are low income or they are neuroatypical. Uh, for example, a recent Vanderbilt University grad was unable to even get a cashier job at the local supermarket even though he had an outstanding GPA at a private research university. 
the reasons uh, is that this grad was bipolar, and he found that his resume was red flagged by employers. And even when he applied to other jobs, he found that other employers had also red flagged his application. This grad um, likely scored worse for neuroticism, even though his performance in university was exemplary. Studies have shown that these tests are, that like the per big five personality tests, are worse predictors of uh, employee performance than IQ tests. But since IQ tests are outlawed, employers have no choice uh, but to use the next best WMD that produces good enough results. So the key with any model is that ability to improve it. Uh, for example, models are used in baseball to determine which stats are really important for the next draft pick. Let's say a, a player is passed up for a spot with the New York Mets and becomes the MVP for the Oakland A's. The people who are making that model would have to go back and look at why, why the model made this mistake. And they would have to improve their model. But the problem with many weapons of math destruction is that they make good enough decision to be useful for companies, and there isn't a financial incentive to improve them. So a baseball contract could be worth millions of dollars. But what's the cost of excluding some people from the hiring process? There's almost none. There's almost none. So can you see, like, this is why, like, they're, they're called weapons of math destruction is because, yeah, we could improve them, but there's no financial reason to do so. So I think that that's, that's, that's key. Now, ultimately, public outrage seems to be one of the few ways that result in changes to WMDs. Um, any system that makes automatic decisions should be subject to some level of transparency uh, where they get, where do they get their data and some level of scrutiny, whether the algorithms are representative of what we want to see in society. Um, let me see, got a question from Alice. Alice asks, I've often wondered about these career predictor sites uh, for students today. Is this kind of the same thing? Um, hmm. So this is a very interesting question because a lot of these algorithms, their, their job is to predict the future. It's to predict not only what your career will be, but what your grades are going to be, you know, kind of moving on if, if everything went the same. So yes, they, they are similar systems. The key to a uh, weapon of math destruction, as defined by Kathy, is that it has to collect a lot of data and has to make decisions that is going to have a big impact on, on your life. And it sounds to me like this is a perfect example, like uh, predicting what career you should go into is a perfect example of something that's going to have a big impact, but you don't understand how it works. And if it gives you the wrong prediction, it tells you, oh, you can't do this type of career. You know, what, what is the impact of that? And so I think it, it fits the it, it fits the description of a WMD. Now there's some good news. It's not all bad. The good news is that on April 21st this year, we saw a proposed um, European Union legislation that required big tech companies uh, to have more transparency and human oversight uh, into high risk AI systems. So these are high risk, I believe, is anything that is considered to make big decisions on you, like like career decisions, things that would impact your life in a significant way. And, oh, that's a good point. Um, and uh, another thing about them is that students generally trust them, right? Like if, if a, a, it gave you a career decision and says, yeah, this is the best career for you, as said by the AI, uh, you would tend to trust the result without questioning it. And this is the key. Uh, for most of them is most people do not question anything related to uh, related to the AI systems. So very important. Okay, so the second way that algorithms hide is by targeting specific groups of people. Um, and we already 
uh, saw examples of this in the 2018 election. And um, this is like, uh, we learned that, you know, in 20, the 2018 election, that fake news posts on social media was sufficient to stop specific communities of black people from voting. Uh, and usually our desires are revealed through our searches than what we spend our time watching. This allows companies to target specific groups of people that are most likely to buy. Like we call them, we call it targeting in, mark, in the market speak. Now, of course, these, these specific customer pain points can be easily searched for. Uh, and of course, the, the goal is to provide the quick fix uh, nearby. And Kathy in her book um, says that desperation, desperation is gold. Um, consider educational loans. So the U.S. loans um, up to 90% of the tuition for colleges. And so companies spent billions in recruitment of the most vulnerable and the lowest self-esteem to take up university and collect this crippling debt. They would tout the prestige of attending a private university like DeVry compared to a local safe school, even though if you looked at the statistics, it showed that those from private universities made less money than those people who were who attended the local safe schools. Now, marketers did find that these ads didn't work well or they didn't work as well on the wealthy. So they continued to target the, the poorest and the lowest self-esteem. Now, in the same way, subprime mortgages were marketed to church pastors as a way to afford a home for those with the lowest income, but at the highest lending rates. So it looks like they're trying to help you get a home, but the reality is these particular uh, lending rates are like the worst that you can possibly get. Like you'd be better like going out to a bank, but maybe a bank won't accept you. So subprime is the only option for you. An example is a caretaker making less than $30,000 a year could take out a loan uh, for $700,000 uh, for a home to buy a home on speculation that the price would increase and that they could sell the home in a few years. When the housing crash came, these people had no choice but to default on their loan. The third way, and, and this is my favorite, is, is how they hide uh, behind this mathematical magic show. So mathematics is often, and like not just math, but math and technology is often used to impress clients rather than protect them against risk. And this was certainly the case for mortgage-backed securities during the housing crisis. The complexity of credit default swaps and mortgage-backed securities was too complex for most people to understand at the time. Um, you can imagine, like, it, it also created this um, false perception that these loans were safer under the label of a triple A rated loan. Now, these rating agencies knew that they didn't have a choice. They had to play ball. Uh, otherwise, these same companies who are, who are creating these financial instruments would bring their business to competitors for a better rating. They would just shop it around. But the problem was consumers were not aware of the magic that was happening behind the scenes. Um, they were not aware of these rubber that these rubber these ratings were effectively a rubber stamp. They were more like a rubber stamp than they were like actually telling you about the quality of these ratings. Now there were very little consequences uh, for the companies whose WMD hurt large numbers of people. Uh, many of the companies that sold subprime mortgages had already passed on the risk to other investors through mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps. Um, even years after the crisis, very little has changed in practice. Uh, if anything, uh, most financial institutions felt emboldened that they were too big to fail. Uh, they now knew that with the right amount of lobbying, governments would bail them out. 